Warning, the following Otaku Generation podcast has content of an adult and mature nature and is not necessarily safe for work or appropriate for children under the age of 18. If you are easily offended by content of this type, please stop this recording. Parental discretion is advised. The opinions and viewpoints expressed on Otaku Generation are those of the cast and crew and the individuals that express them and are not necessarily associated with the sponsors or guests of the show. Otaku Generation is a Red Apple production which is solely responsible for its content. All impressions are poorly impersonated. And please, for the love of God, don't try this at home. Well, welcome to Otaku Generation. Next generation radio for Otaku. Our podcast brings all the Otaku to the yard. Oof. Uh, this week we uh, completely forgot that anime existed uh, for reasons, and then we woke up in our Ava pajamas as we unra- unraveled ourselves from our Gundam bed sheets. <clears throat> We're still podcasting from OGNetworks.tv in a basement where it's impossible to forget that one time at an anime convention, so awesome. Show number 697, October 17th, 2018, with this week's topic, 2018 Fall Season Impressions Part 2. And now, excuses to not make a special Halloween opening. Number one, too lazy. Number two, too busy watching anime. Number three, evil clown in brain says not to. Number four, that special Halloween magic. And number five... Contractual under- negotiations still underway. Mm. And now, that person you know, but don't want to admit you know them to their friends, Alan Chase. Matt, how do you know about my uh, evil clown inside my head? <laughs> that was... No reason. <laughs> no reason. I did show you the good place. Anyhow, hi, hello, everyone. I'm Alan. I'm Matt. Catch up. And Paul. Yeah, we got a poll on Skype, uh, and no Bryce this week, but that was as expected. Though it was really convenient while we're doing these uh, seasonal reviews, he goes missing. Yeah, <laughs> funny how that always happens, isn't it? Hey, I get my footstool outfit, so I'm not complaining. What's freesh? What's bang? What's squeak with the OG crew? Indeed. Okay, so we're not really going to go all the way down the line. I just want to talk about one thing. Actually, kind of two things. A new fanboy forecast came out on Tuesday. So what I did is a couple years ago, I lit up some Patreon pages. I didn't really talk about it at all. A couple people took interest, did absolutely nothing with them, didn't even set the billing, nothing, did nothing with them because I wasn't really sure what to do. And I thought making a Patreon page for every individual podcast, probably like too much to manage and too much to, you know, just commit to. So patreon.com slash OG networks. And I set up three tiers. I think probably most people will be interested in the first two tiers. Um, And so this is just sort of our way of allowing you, if you want to support us, to get some extra things from us. Um, Because we kind of already do a lot of that stuff uh, behind the scenes. We just never release it for public release. Um, Oh, you're talking about subscriber rewards. uh, Yeah, like like things like that. Like in the past, we've done some contest winner shows we never released. But, you know, it's easy to get lost like the bacon salt ringtone (laughs) that that Bernhard, I took samples of Bernhard, made it into a ringtone, little things like that. So there's, there's lots of those sort of from the archives stuff, including like special openers like, you know, given the Halloween openers and stuff like that, um, that we do. So that first tier will get sort of access to that. Um, The other plan is if there's any special announcements, uh, we might make them in the patron-only feed. Uh, Mm. It's just for patrons as a whole. And that's, that's essentially what you get access to in the first tier. Um, the second tier gives you a little bit extra elevated right to access uh, to the Discord server, a couple of your own um, chat rooms. You get to be sort of elevated from the, you know, the, the rest of the group of people with 
your own sort of um, badging of you being a part of that track. Um, you also, and I think this is the part that gets probably the most, will probably be the most interesting piece of it, is that you get early access. So what that essentially means is when we're ready to upload and post the show, even if it's hours, minutes, or days early, uh, you'll get it first over everybody else. Everyone else has the normal public schedule. I don't so, know. I think people would be shocked to find out how close to the deadline the show gets released every <laughs> week. Uh, but there are times where the week compresses and I will get a cut Sunday night or Monday night. Um, so it could come in a couple of days early. For example, last week... This, uh, this happens about as often as eclipses happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, for example, the Colin Luke show... For the last Colin Luke show, uh -huh. Luke got that to me a good week in advance, so individuals would have gotten it early. Um, mm -hmm. I had on Sunday, today is Sunday for us on the recording, um, I posted uh, Bryce's show to that feed. So someone who is a patron already uh, got that today versus on Tuesday. So there's little things like that. And then the, the last tier is more of like having more access to us like collectively... Um, and the idea with that is maybe to do some like live streaming and if we do any live streaming or uncut uh, like unedited content it would go there uh, for individuals who, who want uh, want access to those kinds of things you know maybe an extra special podcast um, like for example maybe we get Todd to come back you guys were talking about in Slack what like about retro games <laughs> today so you guys are having a long conversation about that imagine that being in a podcast format you know just whatever size length time it is you know things like that so that's what the whole point and concept of that was um, and it's available for you guys there is a link in the show notes from last week patreon.com slash og networks and if you want to support us fantastic the ultimate goal isn't to reduce alan's out-of-pocket costs that would be wonderful but i can't imagine there's enough of you to zero that out completely um, but you know you guys can always prove me wrong <laughs> So that was it. That was the thing I wanted to talk about. And um, this isn't just for like OG. This will be for all the shows. Um, maybe with the exception of Polymatic because John posts that whenever he gets to it on Sunday and it's available. I mean, I can put a secondary, you know, post there as well. That's simply what the Patreon page is about. And if you're interested, um, check it out and contribute and tell me. Uh, do you have some other ideas of things you'd like us to do? I've been thinking about doing live stuff, but if I do it, it's going to go into the Patreon page tiers. It's not going to just be sort of a public thing. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick it there to the people who want that extra access. Go into maybe the second tier. I, I don't know. I haven't decided yet. Um, but I know it's going to cost me a bunch of money to put some gear together to do live feed shows, you know, at all. So, so that was it. That was the thing I wanted to talk about and take a moment for that. Okay, well, let's see. This week I actually managed to get out to the movie theaters and I uh, got to see Smallfoot, the CGI animated um, movie, which is about yetis in the Himalayas and <laughs> okay. how they never interact with human beings and then all of a sudden they do. <laughs> <laughs> you, Paul, you okay? Okay. Um... It's it's sort of like middle of the road. It's it's got these themes of you know don't uh, don't trust like received authority. Um, one of the big themes is that their tribe is sort of ruled over by a shaman who has literally a coat of you know beliefs that are written in stone, sort of like shingles. And every time they come up with a new bit of dogma for the yetis to follow, they add another stone to the shaman's coat. And unfortunately, one of the stones says there's no such thing as human beings, a.k.a. Smallfoots, which causes a lot of trouble for this one guy when he sees one and then tells everyone that he saw it. Okay. So that's it. It's it's okay. It wasn't yeah. great. It wasn't bad. It was, I thought, all right. Yeah. Uh, the other thing was I got to see the new episode of... Uh, Doctor Who with Jodie oh. Whittaker as the oh, Doctor yeah. okay. because they did a uh, theater simulcast with or oh. sort of 48 hours later simulcast um, through Fathom Events I assume so I got to see that it was pretty nice um, it wasn't like you know world's best Doctor Who episode it, it seemed like um, 
how how best to put it. It seemed like a pretty standard introducing a new Doctor Who Doctor Who episode, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Um, because sort of like every time you have a new Doctor Who, the the story is sort of like a middle of the road story because you don't want people to be like overly you know distracted by the story while they're getting to know their new Doctor. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Doctor Who has always been hit, hit or miss for me. Um, mm-hmm. I there are there will always be a really good episode. Um, mm-hmm. but for me, like, like I get that it's Jefferson's jam. Like he likes British television. So oh, his he, jelly. uh, so Maybe. He, yeah. So he is by default, almost gravitates towards that stuff. And mm. obviously Dr. Who is, you know, part of his general like interest of history with television. So it has a special nostalgic place for him. Now, um, I don't know what his opinion is about, you know, the 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 most recent Doctor Who, but anyone in the Discord server certainly could ask Harsh, him. Harsh, a lady doctor. Yeah. Um, but regardless of that, you know, for me, I will look at this stuff eventually. And mm-hmm. there's always a really good episode. But then there's like, you know, let's say there's 13 episodes. There could be 10 of them <laughs> that, you know, failed. That you're just sort of like, well, that was another Doctor Who episode. Or that I was just, just a little weird. Or that was just a little creepy for the creepy sake, you know. So, uh, That's but, part of the fun of Doctor Who is like it's adventure, so. but every once in a while there's yeah. sort of like this horror element to but it. But I will be real curious to see how this Doctor's um, trajectory develops, mm-hmm. right, given... Um, it's a completely different doctor and then all of the tropes don't really apply anymore or do they? I don't know, you find out when you when you watch this. Mm-hmm. This is pivoted completely differently and um, I don't know we'll, we'll have to see. I guess every new doctor that's sort of the, the interest. Yeah, that's that's yeah. always the case. I mean, yeah. the new doctor is never the same as, as like your old doctor um, but it in a way I think the, the actor's make an effort to like sort of how do I say this um, influence their characterization based slightly on previous characterizations like you get the feeling that there's sort of like a core ethos to the character of the doctor and when you have regenerations and recasting it always is there but it's sort of like run through a different prism every time Though I did read an interview with Jodie Whittaker where she was saying that mm-hmm. she was specifically not watching any of the previous doctors uh, in order to remain relatively uninfluenced. Okay. Mm, that's probably good, yeah. Interesting, interesting. So where is she uh, getting her idea of, of the doctor? Is she just getting it from, like, the showrunner or... Or just general impressions, or yeah, I, I think it, from what I I haven't read a lot. Um, mm-hmm. I'm actually really curious to see her performance. Uh, but yeah, so she's getting the scripts. Um, she's from everything, from all reports, extremely excited about the role. Oh, so, good. Yeah, so I think it might bring some new energy to the series. Though uh, from I actually have seen zero of the Capaldi episodes, oh, which I'm kind Peter, of sad about. Peter Capaldi was a good doctor. He was sort of like a grump when he first showed up, but as as time went on, I thought his characterization developed a lot of depth. Yeah, I, I watched some of them, and I uh, I can't say that I have a thorough understanding of his of him as a doctor either. So, um, yeah, I mean, I only saw a very surface you know amount of episodes with him, not not completely. But he certainly was took a little bit of time for me to get comfortable with him <laughs> in that role. Um, but I I haven't spent enough time with him as a doctor, so I don't really know. I don't know if I like him as a doctor comparatively. I think I was more interested in um, Matt Smith and David Tennant. Um, you know, even then, T- David Tennant from Christopher Eccleston took some time because I liked Eccleston as a doctor. Um, but I like, you know, it took a while for me to like Tennant better. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think it's uh, it's, a, it's a matter of your own personal psychology on the issue. Well, well they do say it's always your first doctor who mm. uh, who's the one you feel is right. And since Tom Baker is the first one I saw, yeah, it was Tom a while Baker. before I shook, shook that. Hooray for the scarf. Yeah, uh, same thing for me, right? Tom <laughs> Baker was, was mine because that's what, uh, you know, our local, you know, PBS station had. Um, yep, same that's, here. That's what I remembered. 
And so that's what I, I sort of attached to as my first doctor. But I also, you know, this, yeah, I got to keep in mind, this is a different world where this was appointment television. You had to be there when it was being broadcasted. Uh, there were uh, VCRs. There were if you had one. And if you could understand how to program them. <laughs> yeah. And so not every household, including mine, didn't, didn't have that until it was kind of the thing where it wasn't as actively on the air. Publicly. But anyhow, okay, tangents aside. Nope, nope, I want to add something. So it just Yay. occurred to me while they were talking that the doctor is an alien, right? So he can't right. really get the proper, like, whatever to be called a doctor. So I think doctor is actually just his first name. It's not actually a title. It's actually just first name doctor, last name who. Uh, well, actually, actually no. the, the first doctor episodes that I watched recently uh, do suggest that he states he is a doctor as opposed to using it as just a simple identifier. But, like, is he a doctor in, like, Earth terms or in, like, some sort of alien species? Well, well he states he's not that kind of doctor when asked <laughs> to do something medical. Although, to be fair, he has, like, recombobulated the genetics of, like, any number of things on the fly, so... You know, hmm. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Well, now, I don't think he should be able to call himself a doctor on Earth unless he's gotten the proper... Um, I, I don't really have much uh, because most I watched a handful of shows. Most of the ones for this week I'd watched last week. The one thing I will mention is that I am still in Montreal, though I'll be home by the time this show drops. And uh, I found a manga cafe while wandering through the streets, which was kind of amusing. Oh, nifty. So it's called Otaku Lounge. They advertise bubble tea and uh, onigiri on their sign, and it's $5 an hour for all the manga you can read. Ooh. Which is not a lot. <laughs> yeah. I can so read pretty inside, fast. It's, it's actually kind of a little creepy because you're supposed to take your shoes off, and they've got, like, all these couches, and there's a bunk bed and stuff. So I, I don't know. So uh, my, my wife took one look and immediately turned out and walked out the door. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that may have been a message. Okay. Oh, my turn. Okay, I watched. Uh, I watched La La Land. I thought it was cr pretty crappy. I don't think it deserves oh, really? all the praise. Yeah, the you characters like... weren't likable, and it what didn't really seem to know what it wanted to do for the how to do the music. It wasn't quite a musical. There were musical numbers, but there were also moments that were just. Mm -hmm. And the guy particularly didn't like the uh, main female character, and the guy, uh, for the most part, didn't like. Plus the whole um. Ooh, jazz is dying crap stuff I didn't quite agree with because there's all sorts of stuff, especially now at the age of the internet. Mm -hmm. you, it isn't like there's like a type of music anymore that everyone gravitates to. It's not like people listen to the radio the way they used to and because of the internet, people are discovering there are just actually tons of interesting new things done with jazz. A lot of the stuff I've mm -hmm. been listening to has been Toho and Vocaloid sort of based or built around jazz stuff. Mm -hmm. so. so did you ever watch Moulin Rouge? I think I have a Chicago? long time ago. I don't mind musicals. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I'll like go even more pathetically far back and be like West Side Story or Guys and Dolls. But, yeah, I don't mind musicals. But that's the thing. I don't really think this quite fits into a musical. It had musical numbers, but mm -hmm. it kind of had some musical numbers, and it had moments that were just... Right. I never saw it in the theater. Um, I bought it just outright to watch it, and I watched it once, and I didn't hate it. Um, I don't have any kind of recollection of it currently, so I don't can't can't uh, defend it in any way. Um, you know, I mean, if people like it, then fine. It's not like if you liked it, all hates your sure. thoughts. I think they're a messed but up it, person, it also, but I just personally just it also didn't fits enjoy it. In a, a generation that discovers La La Land over knowing about M Moulin Rouge or, or Chicago, West Side Story <laughs> or West Side Story or all through the 40s and 50s, tons of musicals, or um, what's the one that everyone knows, uh, Mary Poppins. Like, I mean, there's a ton of them. Sound of Music. I mean, there's a ton of them yeah. um, that are classically celebrated. But, but then, at that time, they were unique and novel. In today's world, maybe not considered so much. So I can, I can get that perspective on it. But if you were a 20-year-old and you've seen, heard heard of musicals but never really watched one this would be your jam this would be your generation's musical and so i could totally understand why people are very excited for it uh i didn't hate it uh i think i like moulin rouge better that i can say but uh but it was still pretty good as far as i was concerned 
that I re- recall. So yeah, but that's why I had for the week. So I just so, so going back to Anima Yale exclamation point. Um, yeah, okay. What do we need to know? Where shall we start? Well, we've got a high school girl who seems kind of touched in the head, and she sees a group of other girls do cheerleading, and she's like, what, 15? And she's never knew what cheerleading was before then, and she's well, like... Well, this is Japan. They do things differently there. And so she's like, hey, I want to be a cheerleader, and she finds out the school that she goes to doesn't actually have a cheerleading club, so she, just, she decides to make one, and... Also, she keeps calling cheer chair, and that's a very bad running joke in this show. Uh huh. Um, the the gimmick of this is that she, of course, needs to recruit the requisite number of the minimum number of people to form a club. So, of course, she's going around trying to recruit people, and the only other girl at her school who has any experience with cheerleading has quit because, um, oddly enough, she was too good at cheerleading so she got you know basically told to like tone it down on her last cheerleading squad and she didn't think that was fair so she quit which is kind of like hot fuzz where super policeman um, Nicholas Angel is sort of told to tone it down because he's such an exceptionally good constable that his statistics are making everyone else feel bad on the police force so they exile him to the countryside. Um, that's that's sort of like the tone I got of, I got from this show. Um, it it doesn't seem to really be anything particularly special or particularly bad. It's you know a a high school club drama where the club is cheerleading. Yeah, that's about yeah, it. Yeah, it's it's really box standard. At least it wasn't offensive, like some of the stuff that's coming up. So, but no, I mean, there's there's not much by way of fan service. I mean, it was it wasn't terrible to watch. The main character is an utter airhead. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's not really a, a lot to say about this show because it's just so generic. Yeah, so I can't really think of who to recommend it to because. I, don't uh, know. I would not recommend it to anyone. To Somebody be with a lot of free time. <laughs> yeah. So if you got a lot of free time and want to watch something that's not truly offensive, then watch Animal Yale. <laughs> <laughs> so if you do want to do that, it's on Crunchyroll, and you can check it out at OGLink.com slash 226K. Next up is as Miss Bielsebob likes. Or Beruzebob Jo no Okinamesu Mama. The basic premise of this is it's set in hell. Um, except hell is very, very nice and clean and pleasant and all the demons are neatly dressed and well-groomed Japanese teenagers. Um, wearing, wearing really well-cut uniforms and they like decorum a lot. Yes. Um, and since Satan is on vacation or missing or something, his second lieutenant, um, Beelzebub, who is a cute, blonde teenage girl with no modesty, extreme ditziness, and a love of cute, fluffy things, is taking care of the tedious paperwork of keeping pandemonium running in his absence. Um, That has nothing to do with the show, because the whole dynamic of the show is that she's the dits in charge, and her chief assistant is this teenage boy who has a crush on her but can't admit it while simultaneously um, scolding her for being a ditz and immodest and sleeping in. Um, I'm not really sure what the hell to make out of this show. They make they make a big point out of saying that this is hell, and then. It looks just like every other, like, elite academy, you know... Anime. Student council president show in existence. And well, actually, not, not even quite that, because it is so fua fua. I mean, this show is all about the fluffy. Uh, the music is light. The characters are drawn in this, you know, sort of lightly watercolor water mm-hmm. style. And it's all... The, the music is just uh, saccharine. <laughs> Oh, oh my gosh. Okay, so 
So who would you recommend it to? I, again, I'm on that path of nobody. <laughs> All right, they're not quite fishies, but maybe kind of because it's, you only have that one female character, and you do have other than the second in command god, you do have a couple of other guys, and they are kind of done in a quasi. But at the same time, like the fan service is more towards like her being naked, not. Yeah, and she's not even really naked. I mean, they they sort of like she flops around wearing a big oversized sweater, and it's like, well, you can sort of like see higher than you normally can, but. You can't see anything, see anything. So it's sort of like is is like teasing fan service without having like full blown shower scene fan service, you know. But it's definitely shonen oriented, I would say. You I mean, this so. is definitely into the male audience rather than a female one. Mm. Uh, I mean, it isn't the worst thing going if you want some, you know, sort of very light fan service. Um, this is not a bad show for that. I mean, it's pleasant enough if you can deal with the, you know, just the other uh, inanity of it. <laughs> yeah, all I can think is, like, maybe somewhere like 10 or 12 episodes down the line, they're going to have to do something related to, like, heaven and hell, but I'm not really holding out much hope for that. Well, okay. they keep making the point that Miss Beelzebub is such a, a badass that she's defeated everybody. But all she does is just, you know, wants to rub herself on fluffy things. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know. Maybe this is just sort of like um, they're deliberately setting up to be inane and fluffy and cutesy so that when the badassery starts, you'll be like, oh my gosh, what a horrible change. Ha ha. Uh, well, to me, to me, maybe. this really does look like a four coma adaptation. Mm. I mean, it has that sort of set up joke rhythm to it. So I think that holding out any hope for anything deeper is not going to pay off. Okay. So I'm not planning to watch anymore. I suspect no one else here is going to give it another chance. Nope. nope. I okay. Mean, if you're really hard up for for like not really fan service, there's that. <laughs> You really don't want to watch something than watch this. <laughs> Look, the, most of these original, okay, most of the shows we're going to talk about have really risen my what the F meter. <laughs> and this was no exception. So, as Miss Beelzebub likes, it's on Crunchyroll. And you can check out oglink.com slash 226L. Next stop is Between the Sky and the Sea. Or Sora to Umi no Aida. Or okay. Space fish. <laughs> so this didn't raise my my WTF oh. meter, but it 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 did really raise my confusion meter. Uh, the basic premise of this is that there are no more fish on the Earth, so artificially farmed fish are in orbital habitats, except they're really big and mean. So you need special attack subs to harvest fish, and then there's this sort of male chauvinist current going through it where girls aren't manly enough to face down the big fish in the a killer subs so they have to prove themselves. Yeah, I mean basically they go to space so that they can space fish. Yeah, they duel with giant battle fish so that people on Earth can have sushi. But also when they attack it's like they summon creatures or people type thingies like yeah. it's almost like a cell phone game I'm thinking it's based off of something like it, that it is based it, off of a cell phone game actually oh um, hey I was right <laughs> apparently that's the reason for the goofy premise um, but uh, there's this like dynamic where once they get to the to the like fish habitat with their like little tiny one man subs they need to summon a deity which is just this like hyperbolic code name for an AI avatar with like special training that will like help you attack the fish or sense the fish or trap the fish and they they do this like big deal about which one you pick and then it's all about sort of like teams coordinating their special abilities to catch the giant fish yeah. And the thing is, with all this weirdness, it doesn't manage to really be interesting to me. I mean, like, there's some shows I like. Like, it's weird, but they're intrigued. And this is just weird, but stupid weird. Like, yeah. I just couldn't care. How about you, Paul? 
So you look at the design for this show and you see what looks like an implementation of Kyoto Animation's Moe technology. I mean, <laughs> Kyoto Animation is the master of just like coming up with these, you know, database perfect characters who 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 you know sort of cover the spectrum of everything you'd like to fantasy fantasize about and then you look at this show and then they start talking and you realize these people don't know what the fuck they're doing <laughs> yep yeah there's there's so a this, lot of this well go ahead Matt. there's there's just a lot of goofy stuff that happens in this show plot wise that it it feels like there was no reason for that to happen which makes me think they were doing that to set up a joke but then, like... It didn't fall through. It's like, you don't, like... It doesn't pay off with the, the goofy plot twist being sufficiently absurd to be humorous, and it just feels like, well, that's just something that happened. Um, like, for example, <laughs> our protagonist is your typical Genki girl. She is showing up for her first date of, yeah, space fish training, and is just so busy taking selfies and chasing neighborhood cats that she gets lost for two hours and then bizarrely stumbles into the rocket base where they're launching the, the space fishing girls into orbit and because they're one girl short, they just grab her and throw her in the rocket and shoot her into orbit with them. And I'm like, okay, that's supposed to be an absurd plot twist. But it just doesn't come off this way. It just is like a bunch of stuff happened and then they threw her into orbit for no good reason. Um, and it's it's just, it's not wacky and, and amusing. It's just confusing and goofy. Yeah, it's the most idiotic sort of adaptation where they try to take whatever the show was based on, in this case, a really crappy cell phone game and turn it into... You know, a show you might want to watch, but you do not want to watch it. <laughs> I mean, when a show is a line like, wait, you haven't even downloaded the app that lets you summon guardian deities? Yeah. It's like, yeah, this is, they, they, they have not been putting in the right amount or kind of effort here. So none of us are planning to watch any more of this. No. I don't oh, think we're God, no. I'm not yeah. trying to recommend it to anyone. I guess maybe the one exception is if you know what the hell the cell phone game is and they're super obsessed with it, then maybe. Or but, if you're tremendously obsessed with orbital fish hatcheries. Who isn't? <laughs> so Yeah. Check out between or don't check out actually. <laughs> between the sky and the sea. It's on Crunchyroll, and you can check it out. Why? On at otlink.com slash 21FK. Next up is Boarding School Juliet. Or Kishuku Gakko no Juliet. Hi. And as you can guess from the title, this is sort of a retelling of the Romeo and Juliet um, story. Except, of course, it's at an elite academy with super-powered teenagers. I wouldn't call it a retelling. It's a telling. Yeah, retelling <laughs> is a bit kind. Okay. <laughs> anyway. They um, use the words Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. Yep. Um, the, yeah. They do indeed. The setting is the prestigious and elite Dahlia Academy, where the black dog and white cat noble factions are perpetually fighting for status, a la uh, Romeo and Juliet's, you know, Montagues and Capulets. Um, naturally, the leaders of each faction are the girl Juliet, who is named for some reason Persia, and the Romeo figure is Inuzuka. Or because it's the cats in the dog group, so you have Persia for the cats and Inu as in dog for the dog group. Oh, Persian oh. cat is a thing? Yeah. Oh, okay. How interesting. You've been a lot of thought into this, Botox. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Botox no, I didn't put notice a lot of that. That's a good it. idea. Um, so <laughs> basically, it's the usual thing of. We're, this is episode one, so we're establishing the antipathy of the factions for each other and the antipathy of Romeo and Juliet for each other. Um, it's it's basically like all through the lens of like typical anime battling. Um, the leaders duel each other fairly frequently and the girl is pissed off at the guy because she can tell that he's not fighting and battling with his full power, and she thinks that's because he's, like, really subtly snubbing her um, and trying to insult whichever the hell faction she's the head of. And it turns out that 
actually he has a big crush on Hur, which is forbidden because they're from opposing factions, and the reason he's not going as full out as he can is because he likes her too much to to damage her seriously, and eventually they sort of discover that they have feelings for each other, I guess, and that's where the episode ends. Yeah, they've been frenemies since childhood, and he is a serious doofus. Yeah. There are a number of anime that have ripped off uh, Romeo and Juliet, and some that are actually kind of pseudo-proper retellings, and just watch one of those instead of this. Even if you've seen them all, just rewatch one of them is what I would think, say, suggest. Yeah. So, so, so weirdly, I ended up having kind of a soft spot for this show by the end. I mean, I cannot in good faith actually recommend anybody <laughs> watch it. But by the end, and I cannot explain this, I was actually kind of enjoying it. Now, let's, let's be clear here. I'm not actually sure I was enjoying it enough to watch another episode of it. Uh, but it was actually... I mean, you know, they, they're going all in on the romance aspect. The final sort of battle between Romeo and Persia was kind of uh, well executed. Uh, but weighing against that, you have this really distasteful scene where some of the black doggy faction are about to sexually assault Persia to make a point in this proxy war between the two nations. And that's, it's like, yeah, you really did not need to do that for this show. Yeah, well, I think that's sort of a plotting problem that that uh, you find with with a lot of like say superhero stories. Um, like, how many times would Lois Lane have died prematurely um, if Superman were not around to rescue her? And you you just sort of get the feeling that the writers are really desperate for like super extreme peril to befall people so that the hero can come in and have an even more dramatic rescue situation. I think that's that's sort of like what this is. It's it's just sort of like cheap drama as opposed to oh we are actually we we really go around sexually assaulting people all the time. Okay. So so there is a very very tiny chance I may watch another episode of this, but it is tiny. Okay. Right. So not an absolute no from everyone for once, but <laughs> Close oh, to it. Only not a, not only a recommendation. Let's only one of three, <laughs> one of four, I should say. Yeah. So, boarding school Juliet. It's on Amazon, and you can check it out at OGLink. <laughs> and you can check it out at ogilink.com slash two one k seven. Next up is Conception. No Japanese title. That's it. It's yeah. based off a video game that's also just called Conception in English. Mm. And who boy is this a piece of work? <laughs> <laughs> it's um it's painful. Uh, oh. it yeah, and the thing is, I this really kind of annoyed me because it starts out seeming like like a high school romance drama where this girl is confessing to her best boyfriend that she's pregnant. And she doesn't know how she's pregnant because she's never actually had sex. She's still a virgin. And you're like, wow, that seems kind of interesting. And then all of a sudden, uh, a demon pops out of her head and it's a fantasy world. And it turns out, oh, she wasn't actually pregnant. All of the symptoms she had were just symbolic of uh, something where... That, that had to do with the demon popping out of her and transporting them to a fantasy world and them having magic savior powers there. And uh, I don't really care at this point. <laughs> I mean, there's there's some sort of theming based around constellations and astrological signs for the for the magic powers. Can but I know. honestly don't give a flip. And he has to nudge, nudge, wink, wink at them all. Yeah. Yep. And the, and the nasty teddy bear mascot character is oh, like... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you've got an actual harem here. It's like, yeah, okay. And, but you you know what you're getting with this, this show from the very first moment of the opening credits, which mm. are just like this weirdly dark, silhouetted, glistening, hypersexualized stuff. Oh, oh, yeah. So if that's the kind of thing you like... Then we should give a link and move the hell on. Oh, oh. So, so, so there is a video game here. Um, it, the uh, the video game Conception Two for 3DS, as I understand, and it's understand it got moderately good uh, reviews. 
so I suspect that you, in general you're going to be better off going with a video game. Okay, I figured out where the where the name conception comes into it. I didn't re- realize it until just now. Part of the exposition in episode one is the court doctor tells the boy that to fulfill the prophecy of defeating the monsters and saving the world, he needs to have offspring by a dozen priestesses, each one represented by the astrological sign. And that with this army of superpowered children, they will defeat the monsters and save the world. Yeah, that's still a pretty weak <laughs> premise. for. And who better to start with than his son and Ojimi? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and the yeah. the magic tanu- the magic exposition Tanuki is just like annoying beyond all description. I mean, it's the sort of thing where it's like, please tell me like step one on this quest is like sacrificing the magic Tanuki for its blood. <laughs> Matt, you haven't sold me. I'm sorry, Matt. <laughs> yeah, so not recommended. Just play the uh, video game. <laughs> yep. Okay, so we got a link. So, Conception, it's on Crunchyroll, and you can check it out at otrinlink.com slash 226M. Okay. Next up is Gokun Basura Samurai High School. Gakuen, Gakuen. Basura. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And again, this is an, sort of a sequel to another series, and it's it's just basically a reskinning of the Warring States period where instead of having... You know, Nogunaga and Tatoa and da 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 da. As as generals, they are high school students who are. Nobunaga, Nobunaga, whatever. Nobunaga is, yeah. is the headmaster of the battle high school. Yeah, so they're not all students. Some of them are like teachers and other school men. Uh, um, it, the people who control the not control, but you know, administrators. administrators. Yeah, mm-hmm. thank you, administrators. Yeah, so Nobunaga is the headmaster of the school. The administrators and students are various factions in the Warring States period. Um, and and within five seconds of them appearing on screen, they have to state which Sengoku era general or daimyo they are, in, so you know exactly what the intention is here. Yeah, and you've got some of them who are running around campaigning to become president of the of the student council. And various other members are the baseball team, and then there's the soccer team. They have a big fight over who gets to use the practice field, and then somehow there's another faction, which are like motor scooter delinquents, <laughs> who get involved in this whole thing. Um, and it's it's it unless you are really up on Edo period uh, military history, this is not going to mean a whole heck of a lot to you. The thing's trying to be a comedy, but feels like one long set of inside jokes, and that's who actually get the inside jokes, or just like, well, this is a bunch of random stupid shit, and I don't give a damn. That's my take on it, at least. Yeah. I think it's based either off of, like, some set of video games to some degree, or it's a parody of a set of those. Because I think uh, the uh, um, Basra, like, Samurai uh, Sengoku has... Basura, yeah. I believe this is a spin-off of. I, I think it is. And it certainly feels like it. It has the same sort of, you know, very straight up, this is an anime feel to it, along with extremely scantily clad girls when girls appear at all, and <laughs> lots of sort of manly posing on the part of these characters, who definitely need to state which Sengoku era daimyo they are, because you would have no way of guessing otherwise. Oh, really? Wow. Well, it's supposed to be, you know, ironic that, you know, like this, you know, the guy running for school club president is, you know, uh, is the, is Tokugawa Yasu or whatever. Yeah. Well, I, I sort of know who Tokugawa Yasu is, but not enough to, to like really click with any of the, the characterization jokes they're trying to make with this, if they are trying to make any at all. Oh, I'm certain yeah, so, they are. So this is really, really inside kickball here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, let's... What so, do you think? Recommended, not recommended? Only yeah. recommended if there's someone who's, like, super into Japanese history and comedy, because, like, if they're into the history but you want it to be serious history, then they're not going to get it here. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, if you don't get the history stuff or they don't give a damn about the history stuff, then they're probably not going to give a damn about it either. And that's really... I'd, I'd go even more specific and say if you're not a fan of Sengoku Basura already 
and mm. its particular style, this is not the place to try to jump in. Yeah, okay. So recommended for a very tiny audience by everyone else, just skip. Okay. Yeah. Link. So Gokun Gakan Gakan Fak in hell. Pronounce it. Gakuen. Gakuen Basara. Samurai High School. Hey, I can say that. It's yeah, on yeah. High Dive, and you can check it out at otrelink.com slash 226W. Next up, oh, boy, hell, Goblin Slayer. Essentially, it's just <laughs> a gang rape of green... Goblin Slayer. Yeah, like the goblins. You see an underage girl get gang raped by green goblins. So just that's all you need to know. Just don't watch this shit is how I take it. Yeah. Um, to, to give you a little more background on this, this is ostensibly about a female cleric in an adventurer's guild who is starting off on her first first-level D&D adventure, and it's against goblins, who you would normally think are pretty small fry in the D&D world. You know, one hit die, multiple attacks according to fighter level, yada, yada, yada. However, these nitwits are like, hey, some goblins raided a village and kidnapped some girls and took them to back to their underground lair. We should stomp in there with our, you know, token fighter, thief, magic user, and cleric, and totally mop up their butts. And the only reason they haven't left already is they don't have a cleric, so they snarf up this girl cleric at the Adventurer's Guild, and they literally just, like, plod off to the dungeon, and they're like, Ha-ha! Take that, goblins! Take that, goblins! Oh, crap, the goblins have a secret door. They came out behind us. Shit, 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 shit. Um, so... Things are looking pretty bad for the adventuring party when an actual high-level character who heard about the girls being kidnapped shows up and grimly and bloodily rescues the sole surviving member of the party. Also, Mercy kills an injured adventurer and then rids the goblin children of their lives because they're just going to grow up to become goblins anyway. So this is like a D&D adventure where... For stupid first level characters get killed and hardcore high level adventurers come in and do all the grim horrible things that player characters do but you never actually see them do. See the problem is, is that they're like focusing like if it was on the violence side that would be fine but there's mm-hmm. a lot of focus on the fact that the young girls that were kidnapped were raped and completely like mind destroyed. I mean they show yeah, they're on horribly, the card. They're horribly traumatized. You know they, they rescue the girls at the end and they have to send them away to nunneries to to like sort of like live with PTSD for the rest of their lives, and they also show one of the adventures. You say the one saved, your, uh, one saved, but actually two were technically saved, even though the one was again. You see her get raped, and again they establish that the cleric is like fourteen or fifteen years old, mm-hmm. and the rest of the characters don't seem any older. So yeah, they're watching Green Goblin's gang rape a fifteen-year-old girl. So and fuck you know, this. It, it's called Goblin Slayers, so there's got to be more of it. Or, see, the sign, I um, don't mind. Like, violence, uh-huh. fine. But rape, uh-huh. just, no. <laughs> Very much along the lines of berserk, but without the charm and sensitivity, <laughs> with sort of the uh, 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 social conscience of speed grapher. So, yeah, this is this is one to give a miss. Yeah. Which is a shame from the standpoint that it's just nicely animated. Like, there's budget put in this. So that's the more disgusting point. Like, if this was, like, a low-budget show, but the fact that there's actually effort put into this is what I think pisses me off even more. Mm. So, yeah. But it's, it's like, a, a hardcore, serious D&D campaign. Okay, so let's give a link. Let's move on. So, Goblin Slayer, it's on Crunchyroll. You can check it out at ultralink.com slash 226, the letter O. Kakuri Circus. Yes. Next up is Karakuri Circus, which is strange. Um, yes, this is one of the two shows this season to get an actual audible what the fuck out of me while watching it. <laughs> or remind yeah. me. Because... Which, is, which, is a, which makes this a very high what the fuck season because my usual level is zero. Yeah, my, yeah. my meter is somewhere in 85% or something like that. Yeah, the, the, the story of this is there's a small boy <laughs> who is like the grandson of a, of a guy who created this big corporation, and then the boy's father <laughs> is killed for some reason having to the business, and then the boy goes on the run because the people who killed his father are coming after him, and he is quote-unquote saved when he runs into a guy in a bear costume 
who is passing out pamphlets for a circus that is coming to town. And uh, you, they're skipping the part where the guy in the bear costume, if he doesn't make people laugh at regular intervals, yes. he'll suffocate to death because yes. he has some weird medical condition. Yeah. Okay, and, okay. And, and that was the bit that actually got the what the fuck out of me. Like, you know, all this circus stuff, all of this, you know, dude chilling for the circus, a kid runs along, you know, being chased by monsters. You know, this is perfectly normal. But, yeah. You know, you know, when he starts having like this attack, he's like, oh no, I'm having a seizure. I have to make somebody laugh. You know, that's the moment that got me. So this this show has something going for it. I'm not sure if this is something you want to watch, but there's something there. Yeah, I don't expect to watch more of it, but I didn't hate this. There was like I see potential, but at the same time, there's also things that kind of put me off, like the guy needing to make people laugh that just kind of seemed stupid more, like a gimmick than anything mm-hmm. else. I thought the fight sequences were well animated with the, um, or not necessarily well animated, but interesting at least, I should say. This is where the the interesting bit comes in um, because the people chasing the boy are these sort of like men in black guys. And it turns out they're not human beings. They're some sort of like puppets or marionettes or robots or something. And then a circus girl who is an acrobat or something shows up to protect the boy with a super-duper fighter mech marionette that he was carrying around in a suitcase his dad gave him. And so she pops up, doesn't fight the the men in black herself, but she animates this, you know, samurai (laughs) mecha from the suitcase, and it fights the the men in black, like, at her direction. So that's kind of the interesting thing about the fighting in this show. It doesn't make a lick of sense, but the fighting is kind of interesting because of this whole, like, puppet marionette dynamic. (laughs) And you've got the sort of interaction between this mascot dude and this crazy circus woman. Um, So that looks like it might be kind of interesting because it's an age-appropriate relationship, but you also have the woman like rubbing herself all over the child in the scenario, which is less age-appropriate, <laughs> shall we say. <laughs> so so once again, there's, there's something interesting about this show, but it doesn't really gel or turn into something that I think would be really interesting to watch. I mean, I, I thought the, the opening... Uh, introduction section where they were saying, you know, this is a circus of evil. You know, I like circuses of evil. I mean, that's that's my thing. But (laughs) they didn't really sell me on the circus of evil aspect. Maybe it's like, you know, a metaphor for for, uh, corporate culture. Uh, I want an actual circus of evil, man. That's what I signed up for. I want a literal circus of evil. I think there are some anime about that, though. I can't, right now I can't remember the name, but I know I've I'm aware that there are a few actually that do exist. But that being said, I don't plan to watch more, but I do think some people might want to check out an episode. Like, this won't be for everyone, but I think it was interesting enough that, like, if they're into sort of like weird action y type shows, then you should at least give this episode, this show, one episode a try. That's so I might, so conversely, I might watch a second one, but the, it wasn't interesting enough that I'd actually recommend people <coughs> search it out. Okay, what about the other two people here? No. What to you, What the fuck? I mean, not <laughs> recommended. No. <laughs> so, Kakori Circus, it's on Amazon, and you can check it out at, you can check it out at oglink.com slash 226p. All right. Next up is Merk, Merk, fucking hell, why can't I talk right now? Merk Storia with a capital A, colon, the apathetic boy and the girl in the bottle. Uh, Japanese title is Merk Storia Mukiri Ryoku Shonen Tobin no Naka no Shoujo. And this this reads like a kid's show. It's mm-hmm. sort of a fantasy swords and sorcery universe where a kid adventurer um, has a fairy in a mason jar of enchanted water. And they run around using his magic ability of healing monsters so that they are no longer aggressive and mean um, on aggressive and mean monsters. Um, that That's it. There's a fluffball mascot creature also. It seems like a shonen show for like a younger age group of shonen 
demographic-y, like yeah. non older shonen show. But right. Yeah. This isn't. So although I didn't like, I kind of was getting bored watching it. I didn't find it offensive or horrible. So I guess like you got kind of younger children. Mm-hmm. It might be something that they can watch, maybe. Mm. Like thoughts. Um, yeah, but I'm I'm not sure if this is like. <coughs> If this is like accessible to to children who can't read subtitles, because um, unless there's a dub for this floating around someplace that I'm unaware of, the, an audience young enough to appreciate this show on its is not going to be on its own it. merits might yeah. not be literate enough to read subtitles yeah. fast enough to figure out what the hell is going on. Mm-hmm. It's a catch twenty two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Um, but if you know Japanese and you're a kid, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's convenient. Yeah, um, Paul, your thoughts? Uh, this is actually the one that's on the discussion list for this week that I did not make it through. I watched the first five minutes; it looked excruciatingly dull. Um, I'll try to finish it before the next show, but I do not think that will change my opinion of excruciating dullness. No, it won't. That's um, pretty accurate. Would it, I almost guarantee it won't. Would it, would it intrigue you to know there's a secondary element to their quest where the fairy has amnesia and they're adventuring to try and help her get her memory back? No. It's making my eyelid twitch, if that helps. <laughs> <laughs> so we can't really recommend Mark Storia, capital A, but at the same time, it's not offensive. So I guess if there's someone who gets easily offensive and you have or if you have insomnia and you really need to go sleep then maybe Look, check this out the Otherwise, word apathetic is in its title i mean <laughs> it I doesn't mean, lie at least <laughs> and, unless you yourself um are a water fairy with amnesia and you would find this um triggering yeah so yeah let's give a link and move on <laughs> so work story uh, the apathetic boy and the girl in the bottle that sounds like a song it's on Crunchyroll, and you can check out ochilink.com slash 226Q. Next up is My Sister, My Writer. Or, uh. or ga suki nano wa imoto dakedo imoto janai. Or, roughly translated, um, the one who I love is my little sister, but she's not a little sister. Okay, so let me just ruin it for everybody. You've <laughs> seen this premise before, and anything that might be surprising to you, even 15 minutes out of 25 or whatever it is, yeah, you won't be surprised. Um, just just to give you a basic idea of what the premise is, it's set in a contemporary Japanese high school where we have a boy who dreams of becoming a light novel author, um, but is rejected from the shortlist for a new writer's competition. Um, and then he discovers that his hyper-competent little sister, um, who basically runs the household more efficiently than he does when their parents are away, actually submitted the winning manuscript <coughs> under a pen name because she has had a huge crush on her older brother but can't admit it. And since she's both underage and... Student council president, she's not supposed to be entering writing contests for some reason, and since she's won, she needs somebody to pretend to be her um, to accept the prize and get the work published. He does. Yep, that's it. That's that's all that you really know. There is not any depth or anything that is... See, they're skipping up all the creepiness and just horribleness. I know. You give that description and that makes it almost sound like it's something that's watchable. No, no, no. There's so much fucking cringe in this show and so much like bad, like cliched fan service. What? Because of the horribly skewed gender and power dynamics of a high school guy, you know, having a romance with his younger sister? Stuff like that, maybe? And they're also skipping all the like people that work at the light novel company where the editor has him grab her bru- uh, breast to be... Oh, I totally forgot about that. Yeah. So he goes to the awards ceremony, right? And his and the editor for his sister's manuscript is this, like, you know, hot chick who has, like, you know, a big chest. And she's like, oh, I can tell by your stammering manner you must be a virgin. And he sort of, like, says something to the effect of, um, uh, yeah, how did you know? And she's like, well, here, grab my tit. It'll help you understand... Um, romance for your future writing. So she just grabs his hand and goes, 
I was right trying. up on her chest, and and I was like, yeah, thank you for reminding me of that. I was, I was doing my I best. was trying to forget that. And you forgot about the illustrator for his book, who was also like a. <laughs> Actually, let's forget about all the rest of the stuff. No one should watch this. That's the and point. And also, the guy works at bookstore type place, <laughs> and like the, the little girl that's oh, his, his co-worker. Yeah, that's right. His co-worker is a 20-year-old who looks like a lolicon. And they so, make sure that they, the... they make the explicit comment that, you know, this is such a light novel trope that there's a character like this. So they were them shading does not make it all right. They were <laughs> not right. going out of their way to prove a point. The point is it's a terrible show. I shouldn't watch it. And just yeah. so, I, so I mean, this is what you get if you like, you know, twenty years ago, take a show where you know the the idea of you know little sister romance is a thing, and then like for decades, you know, people watch this show and they start creating. Uh, other media based on it and then you get people who've grown up you know consuming only media based on this and so they write a show which is you know i want to write a light novel about my little sister and then there's somebody else a generation later who reads that light novel and they want to write another right not light uh... novel about how they want to write a light novel about little sisters and that is this show it's gross there's a pair it of fan not recommended. Yeah, it there's... is not recommended. It's a multi-generational fax of a disaster. There are better fan service shows out there. If you want fan service, just watch a better fan service show. Or just do yourself a favor and just watch porn or hentai. It's easy enough to find with the internet. They get like what you're looking for much better, mm-hmm. quicker, more efficiently. Just bo- don't bother with this crap. <laughs> Okay, so let's give a link. Let's let's actually move on. Yes, my sister, my right, sir. It's on Crunchyroll. Shame on new Crunchyroll. You can check it out <laughs> at oglink.com slash 226R. Next up is... I don't. I can't even pronounce the English title half of it. So yeah, <laughs> it's it's uh, it's called Rerided Derrida Who Leaps Through Time, or Rerided. Tokigoe no Derida. But the R and the E are capitalized, as is the D, and rewrite it. At the end. Yeah, it's um, like, what the hell, anime? It's what, what's going on here? It's basically red with ride <laughs> between the E and the D. Um, you know what? It's, I don't think he... It's basically, le- as you know, Bob, the anime. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. uh, look, I don't think he leaves you time. I think he falls through time. And it, he's falling into a mess every yeah. single time. Uh, this this is sort of like set in a science fictiony future, where th- there are these two guys, one of whom is a high level programmer for a robotics company founded by his father, from whom he is estranged, and then his pal, who is also working at the robot company, but really, really wants to do time travel research in his in his off hours. And uh, the the ostensible plot is that the first guy discovers that there's this big uh, behavioral bug in the uh, the flagship robots that the company produces, wherein if you have, like, a whole bunch of them and they're all given identical orders, then they will become uncontrollable afterwards. And he's like, listen, my evil boss, you need to issue a recall and get this bug fixed. We're working on a patch right now. It'll only take a few days to fix this problem and save everyone from the terrible buggy killer robots. And the boss is like, we're not doing that. Recall bad. Evil robots, good. (laughs) Evil robots, good. And then there's some other weird plot where apparently the evil boss was like selling them to the military as if this was like a fucking surprise to anybody. And because this guy wants to do a pat a recall and patch that has uncovered that or threatens that with being uncovered somehow so they send hitmen to kill him and his friend and his friend's daughter and i don't know puppies or something and then time travel happens. So if you're really confused, try watching it. Actually, don't try watching it because it's not getting any better. There is a hell of a lot of exposition without explaining any, anything at all. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure why a lethal cover-up is required just because they're selling robots to the military. I mean, an army of robots killing people in a war is not exactly something that you can, like, you know, keep under wraps for, like, any period of time. 
Um, I mean, are they like you know seriously going to kill this guy and everyone he knows to protect the deep dark secret that is like going to go public in about three weeks anyway? I mean, from my got actually like the patch that they are working on can allow anyone to control these killer robots. So I think um, they're trying to kill him to like stop this patch from getting out, which will stop the killer robots from being killer. Or at least so, to make it turn them into killers for themselves and Seth others or something. Is So uh, is like the evil boss trying to deliberately cause a robot rampage and he doesn't want the patch because of that? Or uh, Not quite sure. I'm kind of more hung up on like you kind of skip the whole weird time travel thing kind of like one like he gets frozen I think I'm not sure if you mentioned him being like kind of like cryogenically frozen yeah, and wakes he's... up in the yeah, there's like this Futurama thing going on at the end where he gets kicked into a uh, cryogenic freeze chamber or... and I tell you there is no prize if you bet on whether or not the 10 year old girl who is the friend of his best friend at the start of this is going to become a love interest when he jumps into the future oh yeah there's there's a total door into summer dynamic that they're setting up in like the last you know two minutes of the show and there's also this whole thing like him as best friend we're also working on time travel like for emotional moments or some shit but it doesn't really make any sense and like he wants to do experiments but he can't do the experiments or they shouldn't and stuff like that which like what uh yeah like his his friend wants to devote his life to time travel research and and derrida is actually angry at him because it's like Flaky fringe science, and you're throwing your career away. Of course, I'll help you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was. Yeah, this this show, show is a mess. I mean, it is dumping exposition on you constantly, and it makes no sense. I mean, it is just this constant river of meaningless words. Yeah. And, uh, combined with meaningless images on the screen that seem to have nothing to do with the words. So none of us are planning to watch more. I suspect. Oh, no. no. And, I, uh, God? <laughs> and so I don't think we'll recommend it. <laughs> so... Oh, who, who do we hate? I'll recommend it. No worries. <laughs> so, Rewrite D. Derya, Who Leaps Through Time? Whatever. It's on Crunchyroll, and if you want to watch it for whatever stupid reason, it's you can check out ochilink.com slash 21FQ. Yeah. Next up is Radiant. Japanese title, Radiant. Um, this is a sort of fantasy adventure show about a sorcerer's apprentice who is continually getting into trouble and then the sorceress that he works for yells at him. I mean, we've yeah. seen this type of shonen trope before, but at the same time, it wasn't offensive. It seemed to have potential if they're into, like, shonen adventure shows. Yeah, I think that's about the best you could say about yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, it was but okay. It but it needs to be really like basic shonen adventure. You're not looking for like a good shonen show. You're just looking for something which is going to reiterate the shonen tropes in a predictable way. Or it's yeah. adequate. Sometimes maybe it's like comfort food. Mm -hmm. um, the the gimmick for this is it's a fantasy universe. Um, villages are sort of on those little stereotypical flying islands that every serious fantasy universe has. Um, and the world is plagued by these monsters that sort of fall to the ground in black and white striped eggs, pop out, and you know begin doing their kaiju thing on the local villages. And uh, um, sorcerers, I guess, exist to fight them and dispel them or kill them or, or something, so they stop devastating the villages. But at the same time, the people are generally not comfortable with the sorcerers because, like, the powers that give them sorcerer powers are supposed to be related to the powers that create the monsters, so they're yeah. kind of, like, pseudo-ostracized. Yeah. yeah. I spent a lot of the time thinking, how much would Bryce hate this? And Oh, uh, I thought I would kind of enjoy this. Well, I had that thought, then I'm thinking, oh, maybe he wouldn't like it enough. And so, not liking it enough and hating there are two separate, separate things. Right. Yeah. I mean, again, I found this watchable. I didn't find it interesting in a way that I plan to watch more. But at the same time, if I was, like, in an anime club or something where they watched this, I wouldn't be, like, hating it either. It's I think just... you could fill that slot with better shows. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree with that. But at the yeah. same time, this wasn't a horrible show either. It was yeah. entertaining in a mediocre manner. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm kind of interested in this just from a visual standpoint because... Um, the at one point the the sorcerer's apprentice 
manages to like let a bunch of cows loose and they stampede through the village and get the villagers all mad. Um, and the interesting thing is that the cows in this universe have little tusks and trunks, like, you know, elephant trunks. I mean, they're cows otherwise. They're obviously cows, but... Right. I mean, every once in a while you see something goofy and, and strange and original like that. That was goofy, yep. Yeah. So, I don't know, maybe the uh, the monster art styles are are interesting enough. If you're looking for a straightforward, you know, shown an adventure kind of show in a fantasy world, this might be worth watching. Yeah. So okay. it's not a strong recommendation, but at the same time, I don't think there's any harm in checking now an no, episode. No, it wasn't terrible. But, it, mm-hmm. you know, it wasn't anything real special either. It's not going up on a limb to say it is not the worst show this season. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes that's good enough, sadly. Yeah. <laughs> So, Radiant, if you want to check it out, it's on Crunchyroll, and you can check it out at OG Le- oglink.com slash 21FR. Next up is Rascal Does Not Dream of Bunny Girl Senpai. Um, Japanese title, Seishun Butayaro wa Bunny Girl Senpai no Yume wo Minai. And once you get to that many syllables, you know you're in light novel territory. Oh, yeah. Um, basically what happens is our protagonist is a typical Japanese high school boy who sees his uh, celebrity classmate, um, Mai, the girl model and actress, walking through the school library wearing a bunny outfit. Not like an Easter bunny outfit, a Playboy bunny hostess outfit. And no one really seems to think this is anything odd in fact, they don't seem to realize she is present at all. He's the only one who notices. The girl realizes he notices and then tells him, Ah, I see you notice me when no one else does. Um, you should uh, pretend you never saw this and uh, not make a big deal about it. And then she leaves. This kind of remind me a little bit of Kokoro Connect, the whole thing where like, there's a group of high school students and they each have like some weird stuff happen to them because besides the whole like invisible bunny girl thing the guy himself reveals that he's also encountered some weird shit like he has these scars on his body Mm -hmm. and also his little sister was also randomly getting like cuts and scars after being like traumatized by internet bullying and that it seems to be like there's this phenomenon where like some (coughs) <coughs> students or kids or whatnot just experience things that they know are happening but no one else will believe them because it's just happening to them but there's clearly weird shit happening yeah um in in this show's universe there's an urban legend called adolescence syndrome and it somehow it, it works out that like bad things happen to teenagers um just because of sort of like the societal zeitgeist of their generation or something. Um, This one girl becomes socially invisible. This other girl gets sort of cyber, you know, voodoo voodoo damage from cyberbullying. This other boy gets, like, terrible scars out of nowhere for some reason, which I couldn't quite understand. And I'm assuming that the show is going to go into this in more depth um, but it was a bit confusing, like, I don't know, there's there's sort of a theme of people, like, resisting change in their lives, and if you, if you don't resist change, then sort of like the wrath of the collective subconscious befalls you. So my touch point for this one was Bake Monogatari, mm. which is the same kind of girls having odd things happen to them while our sort of protagonist who's above or outside it all comes in to resolve their situations. Mm. Interesting. Except without the interest or energy. Uh, This is kind of a very low energy show in a lot of ways. Uh, The main character is just kind of listless. Yeah, I won't disagree, but at the same time, I didn't mind. I didn't think this was great but um 
curious enough about the mystery that I'm probably going to give at least another episode or two personally. Yeah, no, I I disagree. I wouldn't even bother. Because <laughs> as I said, it did kind of remind me of Kokoro Connect. I definitely recommend Kokoro Correct over this, but having already watched Kokoro Connect, that was the one where like there's this club and they're like the four students and for a while they switch bodies. Mm-hmm. And then they and are then like... other they, things happen to Yeah. Them. So just that whole mystery thing kind of interests me and there's nothing that offended me with it so between those two facts and this has been such a sucky season I definitely am going to at least give it another episode I'm mm-hmm. not saying that I have high hopes but curious enough personally okay so I might watch another episode except Botox is going to watch one so he can be the sacrificial uh, goat on this one yay <laughs> or bunny girl <laughs> <laughs> okay so why don't we give a lick let's move along so Rascal does not dream of bunny girl senpai it's on Crunchyroll, and you can check it out at og oglink.com slash two one fs. Okay. Next up is release the spice, and it has nothing to do with Dune. No, yeah. and spice is spelled with a Y, and of course it is, <laughs> and and it's yeah. kind of uh, disappointing. So let let me give you the general premise of this. Go for it, dude. All right, high school club of spies who are girls who can sense each other's emotions by licking each other and the way they get their abnormal crazy powers for their spy game is by snorting spices. I think only the one girl can tell the emotions by licking. Yeah, yeah. yeah seriously, Alan, you're going over the top. Oh, <laughs> it's only one character oh, and who you can know tell what? the other character. I, the for, I forgot licking. about the Come little on. the yeah. little frog. Who comes the out of panties? The frog mascot the, spy. The, the, yeah. The, frog the ninja mascot, frog mascot spy goodbye. comes out of people's panties that he's talking. Yeah. Anyway, um, there's this girl who is a typical Japanese high school girl, but she has the unusual ability to sense others' emotions if her tongue touches their skin. Like well, all, licking all of their her hands. senses are hyper acute. Let's be clear. Oh, okay. I mean, she can see, you know, these things very distant in the dark. She has very sensitive hearing, and of course, she can, as previously noted, tell people's emotions and physical state by tasting their essence. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's it sounds on paper really gross and disgusting. It, it's handled okay. Um, the mascot's a little weird when it, when he shows up. Yeah. I don't even know if he's a he. Um, the the snorting spices. Okay, that's a little weird. You take away all that weird, crazy, creepy, stupid stuff, and it seems like a reasonably okay show. It's it's kind of like anime's take on Men in Black because you've got this squad of about like five um, high school girls with like you know rough. It's sort of like low-level super abilities and this, like, spice that will give them true super abilities. And what yeah. they do is they're recruiting this this girl because of her hyper-acute senses. Um, but if she doesn't pass the muster, they're just going to zap her with one of their frequently used memory-erasing darts. So she forgets all about them, and they'll go on their merry way fighting the World Crime Syndicate, which is apparently what they do um, with their ninja frog spy thing. <laughs> when you I say it know. like that, it sounds stupid. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds better yeah. than it actually was. Um, anyway, the, the other theme is that the reason they're scouting this girl is not just because she has talent, but also because she has an ambition to become a police officer like her late beloved father. And, you know, she has that, that impulse for justice and meddling in other people's affairs which good police officers need. Uh, look, I think if they removed all the stupid stuff, it could have been a reasonably good show. Mm. Um, and that's why I said it's disappointing. I, I think I said in the Discord, I said, okay, don't fail me now. And then I said, waiting patiently. And then <laughs> it hit one about 15, 12 minutes in or something like that. And then another and another. And then a little frog coming out of someone's pants. And uh-huh. then I was just like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> so... 
Yeah. Enemy, I, why have you betrayed me? Yeah. But, I mean, it, it's well animated, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it was fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and there were some interesting character designs. I mean, yeah. like the uh, all-female cast of villains they're fighting in sort of a climactic battle sequence is novel. I mean, that is a mm-hmm. cast yeah. of female villains they have never seen in anime which i appreciated particularly because they weren't playing it up that they were female it's mm. just like these are some bad dudes who are out to cause some trouble mm-hmm. and, yeah. and there and you know the fact that that it was okay so a uh, high school club is not novel but a high school spy club kind of is i would guess i don't remember recall another instance of something like yeah. that i'm not sure if they're like a vigilante world police organization or if they're just like an elite super secret undercover police unit yep i was expecting it to disappoint me but i was hoping it wasn't and it did so um that's sad but uh i won't be watching another episode of it because it's just got too much of that stuff not worth watching I so think- for me this really felt like one of these shows, it's the late 90s, you're at an anime club, you're really desperate for some Japanese animation, and this is what you've got, so you're going to watch it, and I guess it's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't plan to watch more myself, but at the same time, I think it might be a show that people should at least check out one episode, just to see whether or not... It... And, you know, what? maybe episode two is, they just dump all the junk, and they just they actually have something a little bit more substantial. But, yeah. uh, I won't be finding that out. But, I the thing about this that's really the most fun is that you can legitimately say that there are Spice Girls in it. Oh, oh, that is oh, terrible! Oh, you had to. Oh, that is terrible, man. Spice with a Y, though. Oh, he's so pleased with himself. <laughs> <laughs> he is. He is indeed. Evil laugh. So I guess, like across the board, we say like. At least give an episode a try. If, yeah. Yeah, what the if hell? Try an episode. Only if you like, really feel like it. I mean, it's just not like, go out of your way here, seriously. Yeah. yeah it's not, definitely not a must see, but it's. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's wait. I mean, I, I may possibly watch a second episode just because this is a pretty crap season. So there'll be the sacrificial lamb for that one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay, so we got a link. <laughs> so, release the spice. It's on High Dive, and you can check it out at oglink.com slash 226s. For spice. Next up is S-S-S-S dot Gridman. Yes, so four S's. double S, double S dot Gridman. Don't forget the dot. Yes. Um, so, let's see. What have we got here? Uh, my notes say, Yuta, an amnesiac teenage boy, wakes up in his classmate Rika's junk shop. That's how the episode starts. Yep. And then some old computer talks to him. He's the only one who can see it, um, mm-hmm. hear it, uh, like see some some mech thing. I don't even know what you call that. Yeah. The, it's the base, essentially an Ultraman ripoff. Yeah it's, yeah. it's your standard heroic call to adventure. He sees the, the message on the PC that nobody else does. He sees the kaiju looming over the city that no one else does. And eventually the the kaiju materialize and begin moving and begin wreaking havoc on Tokyo. And the only way to stop them from behaving in such a ill-socialized manner is for him to surrender his will to the guy on the PC screen, fuse with him as a giant mecha Ultraman ripoff, and wump the asses of the giant kaiju and restore peace to the city. Um, after which nobody even realizes that the city was devastated by giant kaiju. Yeah, it's pretty much tokusatsu the anime. Yeah. yeah I was going to say, like, Super Sentai type shows. Yeah. Like, there's just, only one of them. It can't be Super Sentai. Or, I mean, it's the first episode, and he does have his two friends, or new friends, that who knows what will happen as the show progresses. Yeah, they, they seem like really support characters, though. I mean, this is all about... I think Ultraman's more on point. Mm-hmm. I and mean, it's going to be, you know, this giant thing that fights other <laughs> giant things. And so, and, so... and for all that, I mean, it wasn't terrible. I mean, it, there there were elements of interest to this. This is not a show that we've seen all the time. Yeah, I think it's at least worth checking out an episode, especially if they're into the whole sort of, like, Ultraman or type stuff, especially since, like, but do you prefer anime to live action, then hey, this may be a winner for you. But at the same time, I personally don't plan to watch more, but no, it wasn't a bad watch. Okay. Like, 
Yeah, it it definitely harkens back to like you know the the old style you know ed, you know superhero adventure live action shows. You know, it's it's very definitely an anime version of that stuff. Yeah, I, it didn't interest me at all. Yeah, I, I just was kind of like, yeah, okay. But uh, but I'm interested in hearing what the link is. <laughs> okay, I mean, it's just because like we're not particularly interested in the show doesn't necessarily mean that won't have merit for some people. Like there's some shows that's clear, like just no, flat out no. Mm-hmm. But there are other shows where it's like, sure, hey, it's not our I jam, can, but hey, other yeah, people. I might. can imagine somebody interested in this. Yeah, if you like old school mecha ver- yeah. super robot versus kaiju TV shows, give this a watch. You might really like it. So s s s s dot gridman. It's on Crunchyroll, and you can check out oglink dot com slash two one fu. And this <laughs> we knew it was coming. <laughs> <laughs> so it was gridded for the last four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that like OG Link would have gone so much better with so many of these other. I know. Anime, I, that, 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 same thought. Same yeah. thought. Such so a shame. But next yeah. up is that time I got reincarnated as a slime. Tensei <laughs> Shitara Slime Dataken, and this is uh, an interestingly plotted episode. Um, it's it's basically. I assume not really dealing too much with the origins. This is the origin story. Some average guy in contemporary Japan gets killed by a guy who stabs him to death with a knife. And as he lies on the street dying, his friends, you know, saying, you can do it. You can fight this. And he's like bleeding, dying. A strange computer voice starts talking to him. And every time he like, agonizes over some symptom of being stabbed to death and dying in the street, the computer voice says, oh, you need a defense against that, ping. Oh, you need a defense against that, ping. Ping, 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 ping. So by the time he's dead, he's got like, you know, 13, you know, resistances to heat, cold, pain, and I don't know, I guess stabbing or something. (laughs) And then after the eye catch, he wakes up as a slime in a fantasy universe. And he has all of these abilities because he's a slime. He's impervious to pain. He, you know, can't be stabbed to death. He's impervious to heat and cold. He doesn't feel hunger because he just sort of like, you know, absorbs plants into his slime body. He's he's sort of like a translucent blob. And that's it. Yeah, this first episode is all about establishing exactly how overpowered this character is going to be. It's, you know, there's there's no leveling up here. It's like, yeah, we're just going to pile on all the abilities to this character. Yeah, you're a slime, so that's the twist. Yeah, but it, the end credits, you see that it's clearly gone a human form, so he's gone the ability of mimic, mimicry as well. So it's mm-hmm. like, be surprised. Or if you watch the end, I mean, the end credits clearly show it, plus the promotion art. I also kind of suspect that this might go into a harem route, ro- mm-hmm. route, especially all of the ah. complaining about the fact that I'm 40 years old almost, and I haven't had a girlfriend, blah, 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 crap. Ha ha. it ain't so. Yeah, and the one thing that, that I don't understand about this is why the heck is there, like, a computer voice just granting him, su- you know, special abilities every time he happens to, like, think about it. It's lampshaded in the show, actually. Apparently that's one of his powers, is this sapience, or I, I forget exactly what it was. Mm-hmm. But, that, yeah, like, the voice in his head is one of his special powers. And that just sort of bootstraps him into getting a whole bunch of other special powers. Yeah, so this is basically fantasy light novel. The light novel. <laughs> The anime of the light novel. Of the... Yes, the capsule summary of the light novel of the manga. So I don't plan to watch anymore. It, there've been plenty of worse things. I mean, it wasn't offensive, but it's just kind of wish for mi- f- wish fulfillment fantasy world show crap. So, so there really is a big audience for this sort of isekai show where you have somebody tossed into another world. They're hyper-powered and like they just like beat all the stuff that's thrown at them. 
And so I think that's the audience for this show. I know I've talked to lots of people who that's their bag. And, you know, that's mm -hmm. cool. So, like, if you like Sword Art Online, uh, this is very much in that, except instead of the main character being like a, a, a sulky dude with a, a with a trench coat, he's a slime, but he can take human form. So. Yeah, I mean, he essentially makes himself look like a slop a dude in a trench coat, like if you watch mm -hmm. again credits. So it's still the same thing, so he can transform into a slime now and then to do yep. super stuff. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, if this is your jam, then check it out. If it's not, then don't bother. Or if this is your slime. Mm -hmm. So that time I got reincarnated as a slime, it's on Crunchyroll, and you can check it out at oglink.com slash 21FV. Next up are the two shorts that we watched this week. First up is Himote House, a share of super psychic girls. I mispronounced that, I bet. Uh, Himoto House. Oh, I have to pronounce it as an E. I mean, an E at the end. So. Himote? Is it Himote? I think yeah, it's Himote, it's Himote actually. Ah, okay. Himote. I'm sorry. A share of super psychic girls. 3D CG! Oh, we did not miss you. Uh, yeah. Oh, this, this show is a uh, disaster. Oh, this this that, is that, one of those cheap shows where it's CGI you know, avatars with a cell shader th slapped on top of them. It also seems to be an idle chatter show. Yeah, it's um, idle in both senses of the word, I-D-O-L and I-D-L-E. It's just <laughs> lots of fast talking for no purpose. Um, it's an intro show, so it's one girl joining a bunch of other girls at a boarding house. They introduce each other talking about nothing, and then they discuss laundry rules, specifically how they apply to bras and also to panties. Um, they, okay, and, and they spend like five minutes describing each other's panties to each other with close-ups of their, of their horrible 3D CG faces as they do it. Just yeah. the faces. Um, they all have strange powers. There's a talking cat... Um, under pr under critical analysis, I have written <clears throat> simply, "Kill me." Yeah, I, I Matt was just squirming, <laughs> and and he's like, "Alan," <laughs> just like. Oh. Now you need to be proactive, Matt. You need to kill the person who's actually responsible for these monstrosities. Also, the superpower stuff is just this like very quick throwaway joke, like about three fourths of the way into it. It doesn't seem like it actually matters outside of. Uh, joke to throw in there mm -hmm. so like the only interesting thing about the show is a throwaway gag I don't even think that's interesting no it's not oh, okay <laughs> this whole thing was terrible very much so <coughs> so yeah I can't recommend it uh, it wasn't the most offensive things I've seen but it was it was one. just agony to sit through yeah it was one of the crappier things to watch though and so I don't think any of us have anything positive to say nope I do. Nope, I'll say some more bad things. <laughs> no, it's okay. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> you can move along. So, Himote House, colon, a share of super psychic girls. It's on Crunchyroll if you want to make yourself feel some pain. You can check out oglink.com slash 226T. Um, it's about 12 minutes long. That's yeah. the only good thing we can say about it. But it feels like a full half hour. No, no, it, it should have been less than Yeah, that. 12 minutes too long. 12 still. seconds, maybe we could have dealt with that. Yeah, 30 as seconds. It, as it goes on towards the end, it just gets worse and worse. Yep, yep. So last for the night, or day if you're listening to this during the day, whatever, it's Skull-Face, bookseller, Honda Sun. Oh, I forgot there's a dash between the Honda and the Sun. It's yeah. fine. So um, anyway, skull face. Gaikotsu Shoten in Honda san. And this is sort of like a flash animation um, quarter length show. It's about 12 minutes an episode, which takes place in a bookstore. But Isn't every... that half length? Huh? Half length. 12 minutes would be half length. Well, half hour, quarter hour. Oh, okay. It's, it's shorter than average. That's yeah. the point. Um, the gimmick is that all of the uh, the employees at the bookstore... Um, are sort of like either wearing masks or our protagonist, um, Honda-san, is an actual skeleton. And I'm presuming this is like some sort of like thematic gag about their personalities um, because it's otherwise, it's not like a supernatural show. It's just 
the wacky goings on of a bookstore with all of their eccentric customers. It's not really a bookstore though; it's actually a manga store, book and manga store. They're they're a bookstore, but technically they they do the bulk of their transactions in manga. So they have all variety of weird otaku and weird foreign otaku wandering into their shop asking for all sorts of embarrassing things. Mainly, they're focusing on yaoi books. At least this first episode is mainly yeah, just jokes like they, about they that. have like three different kinds of foreigner t- foreigners walk in and ask for boys' love, yaoi, and dojinshis. And Honda-san is just like, oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed to be selling these things to people. Yeah. It was so crappily animated. It was so crappily animated. It is so weird. All those characters are annoying. Yeah, it's not and good weird. Like, there's good weird and bad weird. This is not good weird. And 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 it's just, you know, Honda-san is just a skeleton. The jokes just didn't work for me either. The, the, Any, the, like, the, counter the, thoughts, Paul, or did you agree? So, actually, this is one that I thought was probably the best of the shows that we watched this week, which I admit is a low <laughs> hurdle to clear. Mm. Um, I, I think if you've ever worked in retail, this is something <laughs> that, that might resonate with you. I mean, it's Honda-san's uh, sort of insecurities that are the backbone of this show, and the, the fact that this episode happens to be tugged around Fujoshi-type stuff is almost incidental, though obviously to the uh, targeted Crunchyroll viewing audience here, it's going to be uh, sort of the, the main area of interest. But, um, no, I thought this was actually reasonably watchable, particularly as it was only a half length. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was just weird. And um, I don't know. I don't think I would I would watch it. I wouldn't choose to watch it. Let me say that. I guess so I, I will comment that, of course, this horrible anima- animation style is immediately peggable as DLE, my nemesis. <laughs> yeah, I, I was waiting for you to say that. Yeah, um, my nemesis. The the art is not um, sophisticated or aesthetic at all. It seems actually deliberately crude, if I could describe it that way. I think maybe if the art was a bit less cheap, then I would be a bit less harsh on it. So take that also as a like grain of salt with my opinion or view of it. So I guess like. What Paul said about the working at retail, I think that might give a good chance for like me to say that maybe check out an episode at least. Yeah, I mean, look, I I worked in retail and I got I got you know before college, during college, before I started my real career, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I can definitely guarantee you there are weird people, um, there are weird individuals that walk into retail, do weird things, and don't really care. And um, but that didn't I didn't find any of that appealing whatsoever. I didn't find it relatable enough. Um, there are people who have just sort of unchecked with their behaviors. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I related to those moments, but that didn't make it any more enjoyable for me. Hmm. So. OK, Link. So, yeah, it's tricky then to say what, but it's half length. So. I mean, if you really absolutely hate it, and then you can just turn it off instantly. Yeah, it's okay. So, Skull Face, bookseller, Honda Sun, it's on Crunchyroll, and you can check it out at oglink.com slash 226U. Okay. All right. Well, I think it's time for us to wrap things up. I don't. For this week. <laughs> yeah, for this week. That was 18 yeah. shows. Uh, and I know we got we got more. But not that many. No, yeah, well, we still got more. And that's the point that uh, 18 plus whatever the last nine or whatever it was uh, makes a huge difference. Uh, it's, it's been a lot of shows so far. So anyhow, for all the things we mentioned here, please visit our website, www.talkgeneration.net or ognetworks.tv. Um, we're going to continue along this path, uh, hopefully um, finish all of it, I hope, next week, which will be Wednesday. For feedback, you can always hit us up at otaku.generation at gmail.com. You can hit us up by Skype, Otaku Generation. Um, please check out the Patreon page, patreon.com slash OG Networks. Check the show notes. There's a link in there. Also to the Discord server if you're interested in that. Um, okay, so we so, have a fortune. And I'm going to quote from Anima Yale. 
I'm going to go with, I want to join the chair club! Exclamation point. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. I don't know how this is going to turn out. Tarply, I suspect. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This week's fortune cookie to guide you through the upcoming week is, the effort has potential to pay off handsomely today. When I want to join the chair club. Yeah. Sis boom ba, hit him in the knee, ras ras ras. No, no, chair. Hit him in the other knee. Chair, not not chair. <laughs> chair, I want to join the chair club. Okay. Okay, well, everyone have a good week. And, uh, and yeah, uh, <laughs> we'll see you next week. It's Bye. all about the sitting. Bye. Bye.